Hey, what up, everybody? Stevie Breach coming to you. Uh, over the last few nights, I watched a uh, SummerSlam 1996. I wanted to come back and give you guys somewhat of a, a retro review for this show. Honestly, I picked this show because I thought it would be a good show, and um, I've been thinking about the, the Boiler Room Brawl ever since I watched the Mankind documentary that came out um, a few months ago. Uh, I guess it was before WrestleMania, so it's been a good little while. Um, but... Uh, uh, I don't know. This show, honestly, to me, was honestly a, a good little bit of a letdown. Uh, it was nothing what I thought it was going to be. Um, I made it all the way through it in two sittings. I stopped before the um, uh, the semi and the main event, and I watched those the next night. Uh, the undercard uh, was basically horrible, and uh, the main event stuff uh, was pretty damn bad as well. I honestly can't think of any real big highlights that I would tell you guys to go out and watch. Honestly, everybody knows about the Vader vs. Sean match, but uh, if you haven't seen the Vader vs. Sean match in a long time, um, when you go back and watch it, it's a lot like watching uh, Shawn Michaels vs. Uh, Hulk Hogan at the uh, SummerSlam that they wrestled at. If you didn't want to be in the match, just say, I don't want to be in the match, and don't do it. Um... It's very obvious that Sean does not want to work with Vader, and um, you almost go into this match like they make it very, very obvious that Vader is the heel and Shawn Michaels is the babyface, and that you want to be rooting for him. But by the end of the match, if you were to watch it today, you'd just be feeling bad for Vader and just wishing like he just squashed Shawn Michaels out of the middle of nowhere. You know he's big enough and he's bad enough to do it. If he must have enough, you know, you know he must know that either like, he doesn't want to lose his job, um, but you know that if he wanted to, he could have just broken Shawn Michaels in half. Uh, I did watch this on the um, SummerSlam Anthology set. Uh, this is the uh, Volume 2, 93 to 97 is how I got this out of there. I don't have the VHS or anything like that. Uh, once you open up the box, these are always have really cool artwork. A lot of stuff comes from the 96 show. You got Undertaker and Paul Bear right there from this show. You got Jake Roberts versus uh, Jerry the King Lawler. Here's the pay-per-view poster with Vader and Sean, brought to you by Stridex Pads. I don't know if they make those anymore. I'm not a teenager with a zitty face, so I'm not sure, but somebody out there might still be using them. And there's Vader versus Sean right there. Um, really, really cool stuff. Uh, honestly, there's a few other shows on here I wish I would have watched instead of this one. But uh, this is the one that I did, so here we go. Uh, oh, when you open up the box, the free-for-all match. Uh, had a, a match involving Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Yokozuna. The ring broke broke. Uh, I think um, Stone Cold Steve Austin still was able to pick up the win. You can find that match on the uh, best of the free for all VHS tape from Call Sumbo video. They loved the match and thought it was a classic enough that they put it on the freaking box. So uh, I have no clue why they did that. It was probably somebody's mistake who just saw the picture and knew they were two champions uh, from WWF history, so they went ahead and used them. Uh, going down the match, the whole pay per view starts out. Owen Hart versus Savio Vega. Uh, the main storyline of this is Jim Cornette is one of the biggest managers on the on the roster, and uh, he has Clarence Mason, who is sort of like his um, lawyer uh, buddy, like uh, uh, Michael Otunga is today, I guess you could say. Um, and they're like in some sort of a split where I think Clarence Mason wants to uh, leave his job as being a lawyer, which is very. Uh, high paying and everything like that's become a wrestling manager. Uh, so, you know, um, Jim Cornette has Vader involved in the main event. Uh, so he's not uh, giving managerial services to the guys that he represents. And Clarence Mason is coming out and um, getting involved in their matches, uh, making it look like there's going to be some sort of a split. And, uh, and, and, and that's the whole main storyline of these first few matches that all involve uh, Jim Cornette guys. Uh, you know, it opens up Owen Hart versus Savio Vega. This is a bad match. The main thing of this match is Clarence Mason comes down. Uh, you know, this is when Owen Hart is wearing the cast. I think he did that for a good long part of his career, and he's using it to uh, knock guys out. That is what he does. He knocks Savio Vega out. He gets the one, two, three. The match ends, and out of the middle of nowhere, fucking Bradshaw comes out. Not JBL, but Justin Hawk Bradshaw. Same dude, different gimmick. And he just comes out and beats up Savio Vega for no apparent reason whatsoever. Um, never knew that they had a feud going into this. Uh, honestly, nothing I can remember they'd give them a feud coming out of this. Um, SummerSlam 96, or not, sorry, Survivor Series 96 would be the next pay-per-view unless they did it on In Your House. I can't remember these guys being anything remotely involved in any kind of a feud, so I have no idea what they're doing here. Um, next thing is a uh, tag team title. It's a four-way match. 
they put all their tag team guys out there. That's honestly what it seemed like. How can we get all of our tag team guys out there all at one time? Let's put them in a four-way. Uh, anyways, you got the Smoking Guns. They're going up against the uh, the Godwins, the Body Donnas, and the New Rockers, Marty Jannetty and Al Snow. Uh, I think he was going by Leaf Cassidy at the time. Uh, but um, there's no reason in the world that the freaking Body Donnas should have been out there. One of them was wearing a neck brace. They got eliminated very, very early. Uh, and I got no word on why he was wearing the neck brace and why he was out there working hurt if he was. Um, but something out there made him put those guys out there. Uh, the Rockers got bounced second, came down to the Smoking Guns going up against the Godwins. Everybody knows this is around the time that Sonny was the tag team slut, and she was um, banging anybody who had the tag team championships. At this time, she was with the Smoking Guns. She was uh, trying to bring the Godwins um, uh, over to, to, to oogle over her like everybody in the crowd was. Uh, the Godwins got beat. Uh, basically because they were trying to get too close to Sonny and they took their eyes off the prize. Smoking Guns got the win. Sonny cut a promo after the thing. The Smoking Guns were in the ring during the promo, but it was all about her. And she unrolled these huge posters that came down out of the ceilings that followed by some pyro that came out way too late after the things came out. Real hot picture of Sonny. Uh, so I guess you can look at her at the ceiling at the same time you're looking at her at the ring. Um, seems like it would have cost them a lot of money to do this stupid thing because the, they were out there for about a second and they're not out there for the rest of the night. So who knows what they were doing at that time. Next match on paper sounds like it'd be really, really good. Psycho Sid against the British Bulldog. But once again, it's all revolving around Jim Cornette and Clarence Mason. Um, at one point in this match, um, the British Bulldog is going to beat Psycho Sid. He hits the running power bottle on him. And uh, due to Jim Cornette and Clarence Mason fighting outside of the ring... Bulldog doesn't know what to do, doesn't cover Sid for the pin, and Sid ends up losing the match. Um, this whole Clarence Mason versus Jim Cornette thing is very, very distracting. In my mind, just like a lot of this stuff on the show, I don't remember this happening at all. When I was watching it back in the day, uh, I don't remember anything um, about um, where this went. Uh, I've always remembered Cornette and Clarence Mason being out there together. I never remember Clarence Mason being a singles manager on his own. So, uh, pretty freaking stupid. Well, then again, I think he did join the Nation of Domination, and he was their manager, so I don't remember. He got phased out. I think he was a real lawyer, and he just ended up, like, Vince looked at him and liked to use on TV, so he just used him. From there, we go to Goldust wrestling against Mark Merrill. This is when they're getting Sable into the, uh, you know, TV, and, and they're getting her over as a character. Not full-blown like she did a few years later. Uh, when she started wearing the bikinis and stuff, she's just sort of like Mark Merrow's manager at this time because Mark Merrow is a baby face. And uh, this whole thing is built around Goldust and Marlena wanting to get with Sable. Yeah, like get with her, get with her. That is a storyline. They're saying that they want her involved in their games. What kind of games do you think they're playing over there? But, um, I don't know. Bad match. Uh, Mark Merrow hits his finisher. Everybody's marking out for a shooting star press. After the shooting star, star press, it wasn't able to get the job done. Goldust and Marlena are able to, to uh, get the win. Uh, once the match is all over, um, Goldust is, is trying to throw himself on the sable, but I guess he hasn't beat up Mark Merrow enough. Mark Merrow comes down to the rescue, uh, beats up Goldust, and then was able to save Sable from the day. Uh, after that, they had an interview inside of the ring. Uh, Farouk came out with Sonny. Sunny's acting like basically she's another chick, like she wasn't banging the uh, the smoking guns earlier. Now she's into this uh, Farouk guy who's, uh, um, he's, he's basically looks like he's a, um, uh, some sort of like Greek warrior um, from back in the day, I guess you could say. Um, he, he wears some stupid purple helmet. I think everybody's seen it around here um, uh, once or twice. But uh, this is a, a low light in Ron Simmons' life. Um, they was going to have a one-on-one -on -one match. I, I can remember that it was between him and um, Ahmed Johnson. But when you know um, Farouk came out there and he attacked Ahmed Johnson outside the ring, I think this was on Superstars, uh, he really did do a... Um, uh, he, he really did put the beating down on him. I guess he didn't really... Uh, he didn't give it to him easy. He, he, you know, he's always been known as a guy who, who works real stiff. He really did, I like, think, he like blew up his kidney or something like that. So basically, he was the Intercontinental Champion. So now they're stripping him and they're making an Intercontinental Championship tournament. And this is just them just filling in time for a match that they did. They weren't able to give you on pay per view. Uh, from there, we go to Jerry the King Waller versus the, the Jake Roberts. Uh, like, why did I call him the Jake Roberts? Jake the Snake Roberts. And this is just basically Jerry Lawler getting over his whole um, comedy stick. He comes out there. 
Uh, he's making fun of Mark Henry, who had just signed with the company at the time. He was out there announcing a match. Um, he, he's taking a whole lot of pops at Jake the Snake Roberts, who was going through his whole um, I don't drink anymore uh, thing. I don't know if that was at work or not, but um, everybody's falling for Roberts being on the, on the wagon and um, you know being clean and sober at the time. Um, I think that um, Lawler brings out uh, um, two bottles and calls them his tag team partners, Jack Daniels and Jim Bean. Uh, then he also pulls a giant, huge champagne bottle out of um, his bag, and that's when uh, Jake just sort of snaps. Uh, he throws a snake on him. They wrestle around for a little bit. This match is not good. Uh, Jerry the King Lawler did get the win. Uh, when uh, Roberts was down on the ground, he poured a whole bottle of Jack Daniels down uh, um, Jake the Snake Roberts' uh, throat, uh, pissing him off and enraging everybody. Um, I think this is about the time I turned it off and was like, oh, I'll have to see this shit tomorrow. But I think Mark Henry ends up getting involved uh, with um, Jerry the King Lawler after that point. Um, this point, this match to me, honestly, like I said, this is one of the reasons why I really watched this show. This is a really, really bad point for me. I remember this match being very, very good. I remember this almost being, um, I, I, I was really let down that it wasn't talked about even more on the Mick Foley DVD, and it wasn't even included on there. But this match, going back and watching it, sucks. I think I have it confused with another match that came out, uh, was another Boiler Room Brawl, probably between these two guys, came out around 98 or 99. I can't remember if it was on a pay-per-view, it was on a Monday Night Raw, but I remember when I was watching it thinking that they were ripping off the, um, which, which, um, fuck, that scary movie that came out around that time that is supposed to look like it's, like, real, um, the Witch Factory, which, they made a sequel of it, somebody's gonna know what I'm talking about, but, um, <clears throat> I hope I don't have that movie. I'm not 100% sure if I do or not, but I haven't seen it in a long damn time. Uh, but it was something about, you know, where they're out there and they're recording themselves in the woods and uh, they're, you know, they're getting haunted by some witches and some shit like that. But this match is horrible. You can see what's coming a thousand miles away. You think a boiler room brawl is mostly going to take place in a boiler room. They start in the boiler room, which is very, very slow. Undertaker moves his way around the whole thing, trying to find mankind before he's finally attacked. They have to make their way from the boiler room through the backstage place where all the wrestlers sit there and watch him and it's very very funny to see Stone Cold Steve Austin sitting in a hallway cheering on two guys Undertaker and Mick Foley as Mankind fighting down the ramp is also you see Gold Dust uh, you see basically anybody who's on the show is standing in this hallway conveniently when they fight down the thing and everybody's cheering for uh, their side either the good guy or the bad guy but um, very bad match you can see it coming a thousand miles away um, Paul Bear, you know, basically, Undertaker gets in the ring, and he's asking for their urn, and, and he won't take it, and it's like everybody in the building is, like, psyched out on why he won't give it to him, because he's gonna go with the other guy, he clocks him over the head finally with the urn, gives the urn to Mankind, and, um, Paul Bear turns heel, yeah, pretty stupid. Uh, Shawn Michaels is versus Vader. Shawn Michaels gets the win. Vader actually beats him twice, once by disqualification, once by countout. Jim Cornette makes the match start over. Basically, Shawn Michaels gets the win. A lot of these Shawn Michaels matches are the same when he's fighting big guys like Vader or Psycho Sid. He overcomes the odds. Um, you know, you know, he has to do the high flying and all that jazz. Like I said, I think this is on the High Flyers DVD, which sucks. But um this match is bad because it just makes you feel bad for Vader and makes you want to cheer him and just want to kill Shawn Michaels. But uh, I think everybody knew going into this what Michaels was like. So in my opinion, skip this show, go to SummerSlam, any other one on these uh, sets, and uh, you'll have a lot of fun. SummerSlam 93 might be a good one to watch next. Peace out.